Welcome to another edition of Drugs, Crime, and Politics, brought to you by the Drug Policy Forum of Texas. Good evening. I'm your host, Buford Terrell. With me tonight is my colleague, Clay Jones. Good evening. How are you doing? Pretty good. How are you doing tonight? Well, we're having a good week. Okay. Well, I think it's important that we start out by letting everyone know that this is International Overdose Awareness Day. Uh, this is a worldwide recognition that uh, deaths from drug overdose caused primarily by prohibition laws are high around the world. And in uh, the United States, 75 people die every day from accidental drug overdoses. In Switzerland, where for the last 15 to 20 years they have been providing free heroin for addicts. They have had, actually, believe it or not, zero overdose deaths since they began that program. So think about it and just remember this, that virtually every one of those overdose those deaths is a death caused not by the drugs themselves, but by the drug laws. So, what else is bouncing in the news these days? You, you know, there's 26,000 people in this country that die every year from overdose of drugs. Right. And we send, spend some $60 billion to try oh, to... Or yeah. More or less. Yeah. And Switzerland, they give them their drugs. Yeah. Portugal, uh, they went to a uh, decrim policy, yeah. and they semi-legalized personal use of drugs. They have injection centers. You have uh, instant rehabilitation upon asking. Yeah. They have like 40% no, no, less. No, 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 let's slow down. You don't get an instant re rehabilitation you get instant access to a re rehabilitation program. Yes. No you, one has figured out how to rehab. Oh, oh, no, no, I, excuse yeah. me. No, 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 no. You get um, immediately yeah. uh, get to be able to go to rehab. Yeah. Uh, you're supported while you're going through rehab. Yeah. Uh, they have 40% less drug addicts today than they did 11 years ago when yeah. they started the program. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's cases all over that we are here that we can look at and take lessons from that we're just not. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing that the longer I study this issue, and that's been a pretty serious concern of mine for well over a decade now, but the longer I study it, the more and more I'm convinced that the problem with our drug laws is that fundamentally they're based in religion. It's the idea of sinners, bad hearts, evil behavior, and it's not something that you can talk about in terms of rationality or balancing dollars and cents or even the number of lives you save because the underlying thread behind all of our drug policy is that if we let someone use drugs, they're going to go to hell. And until we can break out of that <coughs> pattern, we're not going to get decent drug reform. Oh, let, let me remind our viewers that this is a call-in program. Uh, the number will, is or will be on your screen in a moment. Uh, we do welcome your questions. And uh, if you're watching us on YouTube or streaming video, uh, you can't call in, but there's an email address. And if you send me an email to that address, so I'll respond to you and we might use your question or comment on the next show. 
It's been a rough time for marijuana growers in Houston lately. Yeah, they've been getting popped. Well, last week, we had a major raid up in Sam Houston Forest. 10,000 uh, plants. 10,000 plants, and one of the raiding team must have been a forestry expert or a horticulturist because he pointed out that many of the plants they pulled up were quite distressed from all of the drought we've been having. So if you've been growing outdoors, uh, you're probably suffering from the <laughs> drought a little bit. <laughs> well, uh, also last week there was uh, three houses that were raided the, the same group were... The same people operating in three houses out in Fort Bend County. I think that was the very next day. Yes. Um, A thousand plants in that raid. Yes. And, you know, these new uh, electronic meters that they put in on all these houses? Yeah. It will tell the uh, power company when you have a spike going up yeah. when you have a spike coming down. Mm -hmm. And they watch these, and if they're on a timed sequence, uh, the information is automatically transferred, from what I understand. Well, it better not be automatically transferred. Well, they get their but information. I'll bet that there are, in effect, security letters or something like that. But, uh, if you've got a smart meter, you don't really have any privacy about your electricity use. With the old-fashioned kind of meter, they only read it once a month, and all they could tell then was, gee, your utility use has doubled from what it was last year. And, but the problem is, uh, there are people that grow tomatoes indoors. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's really disturbing how much of our privacy, and this is privacy supposedly protected by the Constitution, that has been eaten away by this so-called war on drugs. Mm -hmm. And having the police look at your smart metered electricity is just the last in a long line of what should be viewed as constitutional infringements by the police. And they've tried a bunch of other things. Oh yeah, it's, um, it's getting tighter and tighter and harder and harder for people to do uh, their clandestine growing if it's indoors around here now. It's, uh, but there's an abundance of marijuana out there on the street. Well, I was going to say, uh, I haven't heard any pricing details, but I will bet that these three major local seizures here last week uh, didn't affect availability or price in the no. city at all. No, it's still available everywhere. Um, have, there's no problem finding it. Yeah, and there never is. N no. And as long as uh, they keep uh, it on the black market, it'll always be easy to find. Yeah. It'll be expensive, but it'll be easy to find. Um, just like California's got three uh, voter referendums, right. one, one has already gotten its uh, approval and numbers and everything, and right. they're doing signature uh, now. Mm -hmm. And there's two others uh, that they believe that come next, next election for California, yeah. marijuana is going to be legal out there. I think it will be too. And I wouldn't be surprised to see Washington State also go legal. And yeah. Oregon. Well, Washington, I think, particularly because they've had so much trouble this year. Mm -hmm. with trying to establish some sort of growing or distributorship scheme and their local law enforcement has been totally uncooperative and has been busting a lot of what should be legitimate grow operations and it's got 
a lot of people that normally wouldn't care about the issue pretty fed up with it. Uh, even the governors, like uh, Governor Christie, uh, the Rhode Island governor, I forget his name, um, they're going against the, the U.S. attorneys. They're sending them the letter saying that uh, we're going to start arresting people. You're putting people in danger if you uh, set up grow facilities and dispensaries. Yeah. And uh, these two states are going ahead with it. Well, I trust Christie about as far as I can throw him. Well, Christie's actually made a statement telling New York that it should do the exact same thing. Um, he's gotten behind the idea here lately. Well, I, I wonder what happened to him and wonder what he really means because he has struck me his whole term in office that he can't forget that he used to be a U.S. attorney and that he still acts like a U.S. attorney more than he does a governor. Mm -hmm. But That's true. No, he's, he's one of the ones out there I don't trust at all. Pennsylvania is making some interesting noises, though. There, there is just so much movement everywhere. You've got yeah. Pennsylvania. You, the big movement, it's a uh, ballot initiative in Arkansas. Uh, yeah. I mean, um, the fr that'll be our first southern state, yeah. especially if it goes through on a ballot initiative. Yeah. Um, and there's, I, I don't know when they will have the signature gathering and the counting, but uh, Massachusetts has strong initiatives both on uh, legalization and on uh, medical marijuana. Right. And it was three years ago now that they passed a referendum on decriminalizing an ounce or less. Right. So uh, that's one that'll probably fall all the way off the table. Well, also you have Connecticut. Yeah. Connecticut did their decrim this year. Yeah. And their governor said, the two of them that were running against each other, they both said that they wanted a, a marijuana bill on their desk yeah. and they would sign it. Yeah. And next year, Connecticut has their short session. They have a session every year. They have a long session, then a short. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, already going on that uh, it's going to get passed next year. Yeah. And it gets to the governor's desk. He's already said he is going to sign it. Um, it's happening everywhere. Yeah. There, no, it's not. Well... There's Austin sitting up there. <laughs> well, if you live in Austin, the attitude and uh, atmosphere about marijuana is just so different than it is well, here yes, in Houston. That's, that's the city of Austin itself is totally different from the attitude inside the Capitol building. Mm-hmm. And frankly, uh, from what I gather, just going around the city and talking to people, that to some extent the population of Houston is much easier going on marijuana than the legislature is. The problem is that the state legislature is, I'll say unfairly, and quite possibly with this latest go around, unconstitutionally districted to give the rural, non-urban counties extremely disproportionate strength in the state legislature. If you look at Houston, the Houston metropolitan area, with well over four million now, mm -hmm. out of a s total state population of about, I think it's 25 million, that means we've got almost a fifth of the state here in this city, and we don't have anywhere near a fifth of the legislature are a fifth of the congressional representation. No. So. I know. Um, but 
uh, isn't redistricting coming back in? Uh, they've already voted on it in Austin, and it's it gives the Republicans even more of an unfair, disequal advantage than they've got now. Now, it's, it's waiting on ju Justice Department review, and I'm sure that there will be lawsuits about it in the federal courts on top of that. <laughs> uh, it's time for us to take a little break, so we'll see you in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Drug-free America and zero tolerance really doesn't make much sense, does it? So it does make sense, however, to find ways to reduce the harms associated with drugs. And that's what I want to talk about. I'm going to start thinking about whether it is really laws that make the difference on whether people use drugs or not. Al Al yeah. Alcon didn't shoot people because he was intoxicated. Right, exactly. Those people are not fighting over drugs. They're fighting over money. Drug laws have no basis in science. Drug laws are based on politics and money. So there's this unholy symbiosis between, on the one hand, those who are selling illegal drugs, the uh, drug lords, if you will, and on the other side, the drug warriors. on drugs uh, isn't working, and that, uh, if anything, is just making what we call the drug problem a lot worse. of the Drug Truth Network. I urge you to listen to our programs on KPFT Radio, that's 90.1 FM in Houston, and available on the net at drugtruth.net. And the reasons why, there is no truth, no justice, no logic, no scientific fact, no moral clarity, no reason whatsoever for this drug war to continue. And it's going to take your involvement, and I urge you to become part of that solution. Welcome back to Drugs, Crime, and Politics. Uh, remember, this is your show, so please call in with your comments and questions. Uh, my book tonight may be the smallest book I have reviewed so far. It's a new book by John Giebler. John is a bilingual freelance journalist out of California. In his book, To Die in Mexico, he conducted years of investigative journalism in Mexico, dealt extensively with reporters and journalists in Mexico, many of whom were either frustrated because they couldn't do their jobs or scared to death because they were trying to do their jobs. Uh, it comes as near being an overall explanation of what's going on in Mexico with all of the violence correct, connected to the drug business. And John makes a pretty per persuasive argument that the problem is that the Mexican government is the chief element in the Mexican drug business, that they, in effect, run the whole show, rake off a large part of the money, and they keep the cartels set against each other to make it easier for the army to control them. Now, you can read the book and make up your own mind about whether he's right on that, but this is one that I would move, move pretty close to the top of, you really ought to read it. To Die in Mexico by John Gibbler. Unfortunately, it's published by City Lights Books in San Francisco, which means it's a little hard to find. You might have to order it 
but it's well worth the trouble of doing it. So, uh, To Die in Mexico by John Keebler, a very good, very impressive bit of research and reporting. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, With 40,000 people dead so far in Mexico, yeah. there, there's, they're going to have to change something. The people in Mexico are starting to raise hell about we are the deposit for all the drugs and all the problems, and they're starting to say, give the United States the problem. Well, the problem is Mexico has only two solutions. One is, in effect, to do like Colombia did and simply turn the, the country over to the drug gangs, let the top drug gang take over and run everything. The other solution is to get the United States to change their drug laws and do away with prohibition and siphon that $30 billion or so that we send unnecessarily to Mexico each year. Take that money out of the game. Now, the gangs may still not like each other. There may still be some fighting going on. But if you take $30 billion out of the mix, that's a whole lot fewer soldiers that you can pay salaries to and a whole lot fewer guns you can buy to do the fighting with. So take the money out of it and most of the violence goes away. They just caught a um, submarine off of uh, Florida, I think it was two weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> and it had a couple of tons but of... That's that's not new. No, it's not new, but it's a part of that $30 billion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, back in the 1970s, back when Pablo Escobar was running things in Colombia, he actually bought a Russian Navy submarine and was fixing it up when the DEA found it. Shortly after that, a team of Russian engineers in Colombia we're building a submarine from scratch. So they've been doing the submarine thing for 30 years anyway. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Uh, hello, uh, on, the, on the subject of Mexico, uh, yes. I wonder if you're aware of the recent statement by President uh, Calderon in connection with the uh, recent firebombing of the casino in which 52 people were killed. And uh, President Calderon made a statement which I thought was very interesting and may, may indicate kind of an, an open-mindedness about potential avenues of legalization. It's a very brief statement. I can, I can read it here. What, what sure. did he say? It, yes. It says, if the United States are determined to consume drugs, let them seek out market alternatives that offset these enormous criminal earnings or establish clear access points apart from the border with Mexico. The situation cannot continue like this. So that's uh, a comment that I'd like to hear you maybe discuss. Okay. Uh that's, of course, has been what I've been preaching for years, that cocaine, which is one of the, the major drugs, right now sells for $2,000 a kilo or less in Colombia. The price jumps to about $5,000 a kilo in Mexico. The minute you cross the Rio Grande, the price bumps up to a minimum of fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a kilo, and by the time it's cut and mixed for street consumption, it will bring in about a hundred thousand dollars. That same cocaine, if run through a normal pharmaceutical plant like most of our drugs are, would that kilo would probably be at most one or two hundred dollars. It's the sin tax imposed by prohibition laws that jumps the price by at least a hundred times. If we take heroin, 
right now our most expensive illegal drug. When Bayer was selling heroin legally, it sold aspirin and heroin at exactly the same price. The difference is the sin tax. Marijuana should not cost any more to grow than coffee or tea does. If you go to your supermarket and check the labels on the shelves, you'll find coffee sells for about 35 cents an ounce, tea a dollar an ounce, marijuana $400 an ounce. So yes, could we change the, the economics of the game easily? Hello, caller, you're on the air. Yes, um, I would just like to uh, comment on something that the last caller just spoke, uh, yes. saying that the U.S. Uh, could you turn your TV down, please? I just did. Um, the thing that the U.S. is uh, contributing to the drug problem by, uh, you know, our being or the demand that we have over here in the United States. However, I, I agree with that caller that it's because of the, the demand that the United States puts on the drugs that they can even exist. But what can the United States do to stop the influx if not the uh, things that they're doing right now? Well, I mean, what what other legal methods are there as, as besides going in and doing what they did to uh, Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi? Okay. Well, Go ahead, Clayton. Y you know, um, if you sold <laughs> these drugs at the actual price that they should cost, mm -hmm. there would be no market for the black market to come in. They wouldn't be able to compete with two, three hundred dollars a kilo, mm -hmm. because it, it, you, people are addicted. They get what they want, they need. They don't have to do any breaking and entering. They don't have to steal anything. They don't have to hijack cars, rob banks, rob convenience stores. There, there's no need for any of that. Well, let's look at something else, and this is the demand for the drugs. We've only got one psychoactive drug where the demand has gone down appreciably, and that's tobacco. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, over half the adults in the country used tobacco regularly. Now it's approximately 20%. We have dropped tobacco usage or demand in this country by about 60%, and we've done it without putting anyone in jail, without anyone getting shot, and with no crime in the streets. We've done it by education and control over some advertising. On the other hand, if we look at all of the psychoactive drugs, and here I'm including alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, heroin, tobacco, you name it, what we find is that virtually all of the use, say 80 to even 90 percent of the drug consumed, is consumed by less than 10% of the users. It's the heavy, heavy, and in some cases addictive users that do all of the drug consumption. If we can get those people into some sort of maintained program under supervision or into some sort of long-term effective rehabilitation demand goes way down. The vast majority of people using any drug, and here I'm even including heroin and alcohol, the vast majority of the users of any drugs use them occasionally, sporadically, and with no harm to themselves or others. So if we take a pattern from tobacco, we've got a much better way to go than this continued uh, escalation of violence, crime, and corruption that we call the drug laws. Uh, I, 
think you class classified that real well a little while ago when you said our police force are becoming very mit, uh, militaristic yeah. in their enforcement. Yeah. Uh, we've got to take another break. We'll come back and discuss this some more. <coughs> just going in, taking a small area of my community and for all practical purposes, cordoning it off, uh, completely cleaning it up, using some pretty sophisticated techniques, uh, trampling all over the edges of the Constitution to do so. But I mean, really cleaning it up and getting all of the dope that was out of there. And to my dismay, 90 days later, uh, I had had a Haitian group to move in from downstate. Uh, I had the Miami boys to move in from Jacksonville, and they were shooting machine guns and beating people mercilessly, and, and I wanted my old dope dealers back. <laughs> Welcome back to Drugs, Crime, and Politics. I'm Buford Terrell. Clayton Jones is with me. Uh, Clayton, before we leave what we're talking about, uh, I wanted to make one other point that comes up. Uh, we frequently read in the papers uh, about all of the damage done to the environment and risk to kids of people cooking methamphetamines Mm -hmm. at home. Uh, we just had an example of a politician in California, I think it was a mayor or county supervisor, who got shot and killed on an illegal opium poppy patch in his county. Uh, but you know, when you think about it, you can buy methamphetamine in this country legally. It's prescribed for a lot of children with attention deficit spectrum disorders. It goes under the name Dizoxin when it's sold that way. The pharmaceutical companies that manufacture methamphetamine to sell to kids don't mess up the environment. They don't burn down houses. They don't poison their neighbors. The same thing happened during the 35 years or so that amphetamines were the most popular prescription drug in this country from about 1935 to 1970. No problems with the manufacturers. When alcohol was prohibited, stills blew up and started apartment fires in all of the major cities. Jim Beam makes a pretty good neighbor now. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Hi, Buford, uh, Clay. Yes, Dean. Hey, Dean, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. I really enjoyed your discussion tonight. I, I wanted to jump in here. The gentleman seemed concerned that perhaps there's something else we could do. Uh, one of your callers uh, a few minutes ago. Right, yes. else we could do to win this drug war. And I, I think so few folks realize we've been at this... Uh, if you go back to the Opium Exclusion Act, over a hundred years now, yeah. uh, the effort has always been in the same direction, uh, you know, arrest, incarcerate, uh, yeah. 
you know, turn people into snitches and uh, never mind the fact that we're empowering these barbarous cartels you were talking about, turning a, uh, you know, a few hundred dollar kilo into a $20,000 kilo. It is our objective that is giving power to uh, these, these cartels and these uh, gangs. And, and we've got to stop and think about it. How long should we keep doing this? And that's what I would, I would ask the gentleman who had called in. Uh, you think there's another way? Well, there, let's hope there is. Something that's a lot less draconian. Something that doesn't fill our jails. Something that doesn't drain our treasury. Something that doesn't empower our enemies. Well, part of, part of the problem, Dean, is that we have turned a flea into an elephant. Yeah, uh, this, this man was afraid of drugs to some extent. If you look at all of the opiate addicts in this country, there are probably no more than a million to a million and a half of them. That's less than a half a percent of the population. Now, no matter what they did, they couldn't do nearly as much damage as the DEA and the drug task forces and the state prison systems do. Well, we, don't, we don't have a drug oh, problem. We have a drug law problem. Indeed, we do. You know, I, I, I think about the uh, um, the history, you know, I said over 100 years, and, yeah. and it's become, and I've used the term often, a quasi-religion. People think you're just supposed to believe in it no matter yeah. what, uh, as if somehow believing harder will make a difference. Yeah. Well, let, let me suggest something here for you and for everyone else. There was a fundamentalist revival preacher in the first part of the 20th century named Billy Sunday. And in the year prob alcohol prohibition became effective, Billy Sunday preached a sermon in one of the sports stadiums in New York called John Barleycorn's Funeral. Everybody should go back and read John Barleycorn's Funeral about how he talked about now that demon rum is killed, we can close the prisons, there will be no more families broken up, and we'll have a perfect life. And guess what? It didn't happen then, and it's not going to happen today. No. No, it set the world on fire with the alcohol prohibition. It yeah. has ignited it again for drug prohibition. Yeah. And you can go back further than, than that. Uh, I was looking at some things that just right after the year 1600, both the emperor of Japan and the Turkish Ottoman emperor outlawed the use of tobacco in their regimes and punished offenders with execution. In less than a half a century, smoking in both places was so widespread that they had to give up the law and Turkey actually became a major tobacco exporter. And to this day, I think they, they still supply in camel, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yes, Turkish blend. Yeah. There we go. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to say I, I'm headed to uh, Oakland this uh, coming Saturday and Sunday. Yes, a, you rat. We've a, heard you're a, going to Oaksterdam. Oaksterdam, yes, I'll get it right. Damn you. <laughs> They're having a you know major uh, gathering, if you will, as they yeah. say, it's some uh, more than a mile long of uh, vendors and speakers and entertainment, yeah. and uh, they're also going to have a uh, a cannabis cup, if you will, to uh, judge the favorites right there on the in a tent on the city streets, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And uh, you know that it just shows how mm, disparate uh, cities' perspectives can be. Uh, Oakland uh, was going to allow for the uh, building and uh, of four uh, major warehouses to grow their cannabis. The city approved it, but then uh, the federal government stepped in and told them they'd better not, or they might be uh, subject to prosecution. Yeah. But uh, they, they've decided they're going to allow for a lot more dispensaries, a lot more smaller growth yeah. sites, because the city believes it's the right thing to do. 
well, they have allowed for this festival. I will be taking my, my camera. I hope to bring back some shots that maybe you guys can use on your next show. I would, would love to not only have uh, the, the tapes, but also have you here to, to talk guys. about it. Well, then that sounds like fun. I, now, uh, now uh, Dean, uh, on that uh, they're going to have more people growing in dispensaries. How big of grows are they going to allow? The hundred, or are they going to be more than uh, the hundred? I, I don't know that answer, Clay. I, I was speaking to Claire Jones, who uh, is the chancellor at Oaksterdam University, and mm -hmm. she was saying they're still working on mm, defining what those numbers will be. But uh, I, I will see what I can find out while I'm out there. Uh, of course, I'll be uh, recording uh, a couple of shows for uh, radio for, for the Drug Truth Network as well. And, uh, you know, it should be a very interesting gathering. It should yes. be. And uh, I, I hope to, uh, uh, as you say, come, come in the next show and, and we can uh, show some of the footage and, and see, well, show folks the difference between this uh, Houston, the hometown of now... Um, perhaps one of Oakland's finest, Mr. Richard Lee, the right. uh, president right. of Oaksterdam University, and a man who is, uh, well, he's a patriot in my eyes, I'll tell you that. Well, I've, I've called him Houston's son, made good several times. Mm -hmm. You bet, you bet. <coughs> but yeah. uh, I, I, I'm hoping that folks will uh, um, realize that, you know, the, I, I think the vast majority of drug reformers, probably over 90%, are marijuana centric yeah yeah they deal uh, strictly with uh, hopefully uh, either medical marijuana or legalizing marijuana in general yeah. but they tend to uh, walk away from any discussion about the hard drugs at least yeah. in public I, I know that many of the heads of these uh, marijuana organizations are legalizers yeah across the board for all drugs but they somehow uh, clam up when the talk of legalizing these other drugs well, is, is brought the forward. The problem is I can understand cocaine that. has gotten such a bad name that if you even mention legalizing it, uh, everyone just goes bananas. Well, the, the, but the truth, you, you know this, Buford, yeah. is that uh, uh, cocaine has been around. It will always be around. It doesn't need to be made in jungle labs with contaminants and cut no. with all kinds of uh, household products before it's sold to our children. Yeah. And as you say, a 17,000% markup. Yeah. It, it's preposterous across the board. Yeah. Well, where can people find out more about you and listen to your shows, Dean? No, oh, thank you, Buford and, and Clay. I, um, my shows, uh, I produce now 10 shows per week. I've got 90-something stations in the U.S. and Canada, but they're, uh, uh, they come out of the mothership station here, KPFT, which is 90.1 FM. And uh, I do two live shows each week on Sunday evening, uh, starting at 6.30 p.m. You can listen live at kpft.org, anywhere on the planet. Or if you're in the Houston okay. area, listen to 90.1 FM. Okay. And well, Dean, uh, I hope you have a, a good trip out there. And if you like, you could bring me back some free samples. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see how it goes. Okay. Thank you, Dean. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Yeah. Well, I would be willing to test it. Well, uh, the problem is, you know, you'd have to cross quite a few state <laughs> lines getting it to you here. Yes. Uh, one other thing that's happened this week I want to make sure and not forget. You may have heard that uh, the Federal Alcohol, Firearms, and Tobacco Agency has been a little red-faced lately because... Oh. They happen to let several hundred uh, firearms slip across the border into the hands of some of the cartels. I believe one of those rifles was uh, used to, to kill, kill those two uh, agents down there. Yes. Well, yesterday, the acting head of ATF stepped aside from that office and has been reassigned so that he is now a curator of forensic science to some obscure government lab. The U.S. Attorney for the District of Arizona <coughs> resigned and his chief assistant U.S. Attorney who is a career employee and not a political appointee has been reassigned to 
a right now unspecified job. <laughs> so there have been some shakeups and changes in ATF. It's, it's things like that are bound to happen when they keep going on the routes that they're going to try yeah. to um, circle in people yeah. into these uh, raids. Well, I hate to keep harping on the same thing, but I could bring smuggling guns from the U.S. into Mexico to a screeching halt. How's legalized it? drugs in this country, with all that sixty billion a year from the Mexican drug lords, and they don't have any money to buy guns. Wow, well, simple. <laughs> I think we need to go talk to John Culberson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, if you put it in crayon. In words of three letters or less, I don't believe John Culberson would get the message. He has a problem with reading comprehension. No, he has a problem with comprehension. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, as you can tell, we really like this guy. I think that he's great for our movement. Well, I don't care about our movement or not. He just should not be in Congress. But even he looks marvelous compared to another local politician. And Dan Patrick makes John Culberson look like one of the sages of all history. We're going to take another break and see you in a couple of minutes. Wow, this program is going cool. by. with the Marijuana Policy Project. This is Marijuana Two Minute Truths. Today's question comes to us from Chris, who asks about marijuana's effect on brain performance. Reefer Madness propaganda would have you believe that marijuana causes brain damage. But once again, concrete science disproves this. The Institute of Medicine published this conclusion in 1999. Earlier studies purporting to show structural changes in the brains of heavy marijuana users have not been replicated with more sophisticated techniques. A 2006 study published in Harm Reduction Journal reported that with regard to marijuana use, no pattern consistent with evidence of cerebral atrophy or loss of white matter integrity was detected. It is concluded that frequent cannabis use is unlikely to be neurotoxic to the normal developing adolescent brain. That said, one of the more lasting myths about marijuana is that it leads to anti-motivational or amotivational syndrome. You're probably familiar with the stereotype, the lazy abuser half asleep on his couch. In his book, Understanding Marijuana, Dr. Mitch Earlywine explained, laboratory studies of humans and primates show little support for amotivational syndrome. School performance does not vary with cannabis consumption in college students. No studies show the pervasive lethargy, dysphoria, and apathy that initial reports suggested should appear in all heavy users. Of course there are lazy people who use marijuana, just as there are lazy people who eat a lot of food or watch a lot of television. But consider a recent study that says nearly 100 million Americans have used or tried marijuana. If marijuana really leads to amotivational syndrome, where is the epidemic of American laziness? This has been your two minute truth. There is no evidence that marijuana makes you lazy or causes any structural brain damage. Hi, I'm Ethan Nadelman, the founder and executive director of the Drug Policy Alliance. You're watching Drugs, Crimes, and Politics. Hope you enjoy it. Clayton, I want to run a proposition by you. Okay. You know, uh, we've been talking about politicians tonight. Mm -hmm. And frankly, for the past couple of years, Congress especially has, I think, really disgraced itself. We have people that yell at the president during speeches 
we have arguments that are screamed rather than discussed. We have just totally out of control tempers and rage. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking that maybe it would be better if with all of the members of Congress and all of the candidates running for Congress, if before we let them go onto the floor of Congress or into a committee meeting or before they made any public appearance, we made them toke up. Just think what a mellow Congress would be like. Yes. Now, <clears throat> the only problem I can see with it is that it might overload the congressional cafeteria. Yes, they will get a definite case of the munchies. We, yeah, and, and even then, though, to keep it straight, one of the parties we could give ho-hos and the other one would give Twinkies, <laughs> and that way it would make it easy to keep score of the food fight. <clears throat> that would be good. Now, if we did this, though, to keep things fair and, and even, I think we'll also probably have to require it of all of the reporters and commentators that cover politics as well. Mm -hmm. Can you see, for instance, Bill O'Reilly mellowed out? Or John Hannity? Or John Hannity. Now, I don't think we'd let Glenn back have any because <laughs> he's already been sampling something, I'm sure. And Rush Limbaugh's so far on pain pills. Well, well he's got enough pain pills yeah. to last him the rest of his life. The, the only problem. Yeah, it's I'm amazing. I'm still amazed that that man never had any kind of judicial consequences for admitting that he was using thousands of oh, pills. He, yeah, he got an I'm sorry slap on the wrist deferred adjudication. Now, the, the thing is with my thing, the only problem I see is that I have to reschedule all of the Sunday morning talk shows because if the moderator and the guests were all mellow. poked up and mellow, some of those shows could run for three or four days. <laughs> I don't know. It's just this is a thought that, that might solve some of our political problems. And then there's another problem is getting some people with uh, some common sense into those seats. That's impossible. I mean, I don't think it's impossible. I mean, you got people, uh, Ron Paul, he believes in states' rights, but he's not a good person for our, our cause because he feels a state should be able to leave it against the law and make you go to jail well, forever as my, far as he's my concerned. My problem is that I've spent my life studying the Constitution and studying it hard and studying the history of it. And in spite of what these people say, under the Constitution, states have no rights, period. Now, rights belong to individuals. And the governments have responsibilities and powers to carry out those responsibilities. Their main responsibility is to protect the rights of the citizens. But even there, if you read carefully, the states have nothing to do with the Constitution. They didn't form it. They're not parties to it. If you read the preamble, the Constitution belongs to we the people. Everything it says about the states in it is a limitation on them. So don't get me started because these states' rights guys are trying to fight the Civil War all over again and they lost that time and they ought to let well enough alone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's true. I'm sorry, you punched one of my buttons there. Well, that's all right. Uh, I, I, I don't understand how the American public is just standing still as these things are totally taken away from us. Uh, I look up to Wisconsin, what happened last year. I honestly believe that's the start of it. I think Wisconsin, we're starting to see the people wake up. Those recall elections they've had up there are quite literally 
unprecedented in the United States. And with two of those Republican senators recalled, and none of the Democrats recalled, and with a recall petition on the way for their governor, I think that we've got a case there where you've got some people that are really pissed off in doing something about it. And in one town in either Illinois or Indiana, their schools are two weeks into the session and hasn't started Indiana. because the teachers are on strike, refusing to let the school board arbitrarily impose no suspicion, no cause drug testing on them. And you know, I'm not sure that I have ever heard of an instance of a teacher causing problems in school due to that teacher's having used drugs. I mean, it's just hysteria with no basis behind it. But I think that people are getting mad, and they're getting mad in a good way, not what we saw a year ago with people just ranting hysterically but with people actually getting determined to do something. Mm -hmm. You want to say anything quick before we run out? No, I mean, uh, I, I just honestly feel that's the start of the things to come. Yeah. I think that people all over this country are fed up with their local and federal government and yeah. officials. Yeah, and I think it's important that people realize that with any of your elected representatives you hire them and you can fire them. That's right. None if, of them have lifetime tenure. If they're, so if they're in office, we should vote them out and get yeah. new people in there. We're about to run out of time tonight. Uh, I feel like it's been a pretty good way to spend our time. Uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. And remember, write that handwritten with a stamp on it letter to your representatives and Congress people. And good Congress. night and keep up the fight. important thing that we could do, the single most important thing that we could do is end the war on drugs.